We need you to find a comfortable space that's not only comfortable. I'm in the goddamn club, aren't I? I want you to shut your eyes and go there. You wanna get nuts? We'll meet you on the other side. Come on, let's get nuts. I'm talking to whoever's listening out there. Now drink this, son. It'll make you feel better. From the Scott and Stronghold, this is the Stumbling Scotsman. Josh Scotton. Hey, 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 all my friends, and welcome to the very first Stumbling Scotsman. Here at the Stumbling Scotsman, we talk all things, everything, whatever I want to talk about because this is my clubhouse. And right now, I want to talk about what's been eating at me for about 24 hours now. It's that Kansas, my beloved Kansas Jayhawks, lost to the Oklahoma State Cowboys yesterday inside Allen Fieldhouse, one, a place where I could probably count how many losses. I've seen in my entire lifetime. I am 30 years old or almost 30 years old, and I literally think I can count how many times they've lost inside Allen Fieldhouse on my extremities, whether it be my fingers, I think just my fingers, maybe my fingers and toes. Either way, that's a pretty good thing to be able to say because my point is Kansas does not lose inside Allen Fieldhouse, but they did last night because they let Oklahoma State Cowboys come in here and dictate the game to them and uh, to be quite honest I think it was pretty uh, pretty obvious that the Cowboys wanted this game a lot more than the Kansas Jayhawks the Super Bowl is tomorrow today is Saturday tomorrow is Sunday and that means Super Bowl Sunday and I think for the Cowboys Saturday was their Super Bowl because this is let's be honest this is a team that's probably not going to make the tournament probably not going to be lingering around in March and this was the biggest game of their season and they played like it Kansas did not this was a game Kansas could throw away didn't really matter if they won or lost this game other than to continue their 18 game home winning or 18 game a nation leading winning streak or their 33 game home winning streak both those records are at an end now but other than that nothing is lost for these Kansas Jayhawks in fact I would argue that something possibly was gained this is a team that quite frankly didn't really have a lot more to play for this season until they get into Big 12 tournament time and they get into uh, March Madness. So until then, this team didn't really have a lot to play for. And uh, after a loss, now all of a sudden they do. This team will not get the number one overall rank next week. In fact, they will probably drop out of the top five uh, when the polls come out on Monday. And for my money, that's a good thing. I do not mind seeing that because this team was not where they needed to be. This team has been coasting by with their talent alone, superior talent, um, and they've been coasting by. Uh, you know, I went and saw the Harlem Globetrotters recently. They had two characters out there that caught my eye, one named Tiny, who was obviously seven foot eight, and then a guy named Too Tall, who was about five foot one. Uh, Too Tall and Tiny got into it at one point, and Too Tall tried to come attack Tiny, and... He was fighting a lot harder, working a lot more, moving a lot more, whereas Tiny stood there with his big, about probably foot-sized palm stuck squarely on the forehead of Too Tall. And no matter how much Too Tall fight, no matter how much more effort Too Tall gave, Tiny's big hand extended was enough to keep too tall at bay and that's what if you can follow my analogy that's where I think this Kansas team has been they have been winning despite facing teams that were working twice as hard giving twice as much effort and still able to win because they were just so much bigger so much more powerful so much more strong and they've been able to win like that and 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 there was times like we saw against Iowa State like we saw against Texas that this team she probably should have lost those games, but just they got close, but they were still able to pull it off. That did not happen on Saturday. Kansas, with 16 total turnovers, 
in in this game. Now I know everybody's gonna you know that last minute, those last sixty seconds, it was very very exciting as a Kansas fan. Um, couldn't get the job done, obviously, but uh, a lot of fun. Ben McLemore continues to be clutch. Hits a three with under 60 seconds, and then Andrew White comes out of the ice chest off the bench, sat there for for 39 minutes, 39 minutes sitting on the bench, comes off with sixty under 60 seconds left in this game, hits a three, and then immediately steals the ball back and goes to the free throw line. Unfortunately, he missed the front end of that those two shots, but um, very impressive uh, by Andrew White uh, and Kevin Young. My goodness, uh, this guy his his stat line was you know consistent. Let's look, th- three of five shooting, um, six of eight from the line, seven total rebounds, five of those defensive. Uh, 12 total points, four steals, four steals. Just a very active game. 24 minutes for this guy, but just over a half of basketball played and uh, just continues to shine, continues to just show more effort on a weekly basis. Um, you know, you could argue that Ben McLemore and, and guys like Jeff Withy are more productive, and you'd probably be correct, but in terms of effort, game in and game out, especially over the last handful or a couple weeks. Uh, Kevin Young has been, for my money, Kansas's best player, most consistent player, and certainly the guy that's giving playing like he still has something to play for, even though Kansas at this point, as I said earlier, does not really have a lot going on right now uh, other than to, to can try to get better, which they need to do. Uh, this team just turned the ball over way too much. 16 turnovers, four of those going to Elias Johnson, who I know everybody is going to blame and throw under the bus for this loss, especially because he turned the ball over with about seven seconds left when Kansas was trying to tie the game down three. Um, but uh, what most people will not point to is that Ben McLemore, also a Kansas star player, a guy everybody loves, four turnovers. Another guy... Uh, that can- all Kansas fans love Jeff Withy, another four turnovers. So uh, those are two guys, two two of Kansas's uh, Kansas fans' favorite players, and and they had as many turnovers as the guy Elijah Johnson that I'm sure everybody's throwing under the bus today. So that th- those guys contributed to 16 total turnovers, 26 points co- off of turnovers for the Oklahoma State Cowboys, 23 of those second chance points uh, off the boards too. So uh, just not a lot of effort overall from these Kansas Jayhawks and. Uh, and to be honest with you, I think that's probably what this Kansas needs. And Kansas team needs. I think you, as Kansas fan, as Kansas fans, we get spoiled and we do not want to lose. We expect not to lose at all. And this is a game that uh, nobody wanted to lose. Everybody wants that shiny number one sitting next to their their name uh, in uh, come come this time of the year. But um, the truth is, doesn't matter right now. What we need is for this team to get better because they are not good enough to win a championship right now. Certainly have the talent, ta- talent, talent at the yin yang right now. But uh, just boneheaded plays, not 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 strong passing the ball, not taking care of the ball, not being safe, not playing strong on the boards. You know, this is a team that with guys like Kevin Young and and Jamari Trailer and Jeff Withy, they should be dominating these boards right now. We've seen enough from all three of those guys, even Perry Ellis, to know that they these guys have the potential to dominate. Those guys are four deep. Everybody wants to talk about how d- not deep this can, how shallow I guess I should say that this Kansas team is when it comes to when it comes to depth. But I disagree. I think they got a lot of depth. I think. We've seen it in, in bits and pieces and spurts from a lot of these guys coming off the bench. And and unfortunately, what we're not seeing is is consistency anywhere, whether it be from our starters or from our bench guys. There's not a lot of consistency. And I think when this team decides to put it all together and, and, and everybody have everybody get on board and everybody put in the same kind of effort that we've seen from guys like Kevin Young over the past couple of weeks, then I think that's when this team is really going to shine. And Bill, one thing we've learned from Bill Self, and we know we will get from Bill Self, is this team does not does not bail out after losses. They come back strong, and they come back powerful, and they learn from their mistakes. So uh, hopefully that is the case as uh, Kansas moves forward. Obviously a disappointing loss, but we shall move forward. Speaking of moving forward, let's get away from the sports realm because I am getting kind of depressed. I want to cheer myself up, so I am going to go to some WWE wrestling right after this transition. Uh, 
Welcome back. I am Josh Scott, and your host of the Stumbling Scotsman, where we talk all things, everything. And right now, I want to talk what is near and dear to my heart, something I have spent years accumulating worthless knowledge on the world of wrestling. And, uh... ESPN has legitimized one of my loves in life and started giving a top 10 a power ranking of WWE superstars. So each week I will break down who is in the top 10 and give my approval and or disapproval for all of you that are not wrestling fans. Well, turn the podcast off because I am a big wrestling fan and this is my clubhouse. So we talk what I want to talk about and right now I want to talk about Number 10, The Big Show. Yes, The Big Show. He has been putting over, which means he's been hyping up Alberto Del Rio, who is a new superstar and coming around and getting a lot of pub lately. And a big reason for that is guys like The Big Show helping to make him look good. And so for that reason, no matter if he's old or as some refer to him, The Big Slow, he is doing a fantastic job pushing some of the younger guys, which the WWE is desperate for. They need a lot of these young guys to come around and uh, because the talent pool, is quite frankly, isn't there anymore. All the guys that used to bring in the numbers and bring in the, the pay-per-views, um, those guys are retired or dead, unfortunately. And so it's kind of left the cupboard a little bare. So having guys like Alberto Del Rio come up and ascend and, and turn into main stayers, uh, it's very important, and that can't get done without guys like The Big Show doing a good job trying to make them look good. So, number 10, The Big Show. They got no problem with that whatsoever. Number 9, Sheamus. Uh, not a big fan of Sheamus. He's got a good look. I like a lot of the signs out in the crowd, some of the McDonald's. Ronald McDonald references because he does look an awful lot like Ronald McDonald. He is a ginger in the face, ginger on the top of the head, and about as pale white as you can possibly be. But um, I know this is a guy, uh, Triple H, uh, the son-in-law of Vince McMahon and future owner slash president slash CEO of WWE. I know he's got a, a guy that Triple H likes a lot, and so he pushes a lot. I am not a big fan. But um, just because he's simply just not that interesting. He's really big, really pale, and really ginger. Uh, that's about it. So not a big fan. Uh, he comes in at number nine. I would probably put him less than that, if not off the charts. So coming in at number eight, The Shield. Sierra Hotel. India. Echo. Lima. Delta. Shield. This is a new group who I am a big fan of. Unfortunately, they are not being pushed like I'd like to see them pushed. Now, you say being pushed, I see them every week headlining. They are the big story each week, and that is true, but we have yet to see these guys wrestle. These guys, uh, Dean Ambrose, Roman Reigns, Seth Rollins, these are all guys that are, are highly regarded and have been highly regarded on the independent scenes and then down in Florida Championship Wrestling, the minor leagues of the WWE. Uh, these guys have been down there paying their dues for a long time, and they've people have liked these guys quite a bit, especially Dean Ambrose. This is a guy I've heard compared to uh, Dean Malenko's skills with uh, uh, the Rock's mic skills. So um, this is a guy that can talk, he can wrestle, and um, he's got a, a really good technician. So um, I would like to see him in the ring. Uh, you know, you got a guy like that. Uh, you've had him in there for several months now, and all you've had him do is run through the audience and beat up uh, various people in the ring in, in mob mob style. So uh, you're not really utilizing this guy like you uh, uh, You're not utilizing his skills. So um, I'd like to see all these guys uh, get an opportunity to doing some different things. I mean, it's a fun shtick, but uh, hey, let's get them in the ring. Let's see them wrestle. We'll see what they could do. Uh, they come in at number eight. I'd probably even put them higher than that because those guys are one of the few reasons to actually tune in right now and a few young guys that you can look at and say, hey, these guys can carry the company in, you know, five, six, seven years. So uh, that's big because, the as I said, stated before, this company needs it. Coming in at number seven, Dolph Ziggler uh, put in 50 minutes in the Royal Rumble. That's pretty good. 
And it looks like he is going to be going on a feud with Y2J, Chris Jericho, who comes in at number six, oddly enough. So this is a, this is a good pairing here. Number seven, Dolph Ziggler. Number six, Chris Jericho, because these guys will be heading into a feud, probably into WrestleMania. This is good. This is great. These are two guys. And see, this is what wrestling has needed for a long time. Get rid of all the BS and, and all, the, all the drama and and things like this and just have two guys that are really good technicians going at it in the ring. These are two guys that can both talk, two guys that are really charismatic, two guys that can carry carry the weight in the ring and it's going to be very interesting to see what these guys can do. I got a feeling this is going to be a fantastic feud uh, and, and these matches are going to be even better. A lot of times the tendency is when you get these big hulking guys just even fast forward through these matches. I know I've done that a lot with uh, big show matches over the years but um, um, not in this case these two guys are gonna there's gonna be a lot of fun to watch this is why wrestling is good and why it should be considered a sport and why it is a sport these these guys uh, are gonna go to war and that's gonna be a fantastic battle but which is good for Dolph Ziggler because they've got him paired with AJ Lee right now who is for uh, not a lot of fun to watch there are plenty of other avenues to see cute girls running around and wrestling is not one of them for me so for my money get it out of there i want to see you guys going at it i want to see good talkers on the mic i want to see good tacticians in the ring i do not want to see girls running around and mucking it all up especially with drama about who's dating who who's making out with who not a lot of interest there for me so get rid of the bs Dolph ziggler is a good enough wrestler to carry it on his own he does not need uh, a prop like aj lee running around that just uh, for me it waters down his character and ruin so i'm really looking forward to see what they're doing with Dolph ziggler and hopefully they continue to drop aj coming in at number five Brock Lesnar, yes, Brock Lesnar, the former NFL star, former, uh, I wouldn't quite call him a star, I guess he was in Kansas City because he got in a fight in Chiefs training camp one year when he had a late hit, I believe, on Trent Green, I don't remember, but yes, they got started a brawl in Kansas City, former MMA star, yeah, he was a star, but he was a two-time champion, and obviously WWE star before that, so uh, he made his return last week on Monday Night Raw when he gave Vince McMahon the F5. Pretty cool. Apparently, I'm not sure. I'm still trying to figure out if this is a real injury or not. Sometimes in the WWE, it's hard to tell. But he took a, looked like a pretty rough fall and, uh, and didn't land evenly. It looked like he could have gotten hurt on that real, uh, what looked to be a pretty, pretty vicious F5. But they're saying he broke his hip. Uh, and went into surgery is hard to say sometimes these things are true sometimes they are not so uh, just hard to tell which is why I love the WWE you never really know where that line between reality and fantasy ends sometimes it does sometimes it doesn't sometimes it's a little bit of both so uh, always 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 fun so we never really know what we got but right now it looks like Vince McMahon is out for a while after he you know, just came back but uh, looks like Brock Lesnar uh, is uh, getting set up to go against Triple H, who I imagine will come back for WrestleMania and or Elimination Chamber, maybe both, to um, avenge his father-in-law, Vince McMahon. So that's setting up pretty good. A lot of people don't like this. I believe this is a rematch of a SummerSlam, perhaps. Uh, this match has happened before. Either way, that's kind of the life of the WWE. You get the replay button a lot. But um, hopefully they take a different angle on it and, and make it a lot of fun. Whenever you get Brock Lesnar in the ring, you never really know what you're going to get. He's kind of a loose cannon. So either way, it should be a lot of fun. Coming in at number four, John Cena. He is the Royal Rumble winner. I don't have a problem with this. A lot of people really dislike John Cena. I am not one of them. Not much to dislike about this guy other than kind of the same old shtick over and over again. I'd like to see this guy turn heel. That's uh, probably like waiting for Hulk Hogan to turn heel. Took him about... Uh, 20 years to finally turn into a bad guy when he did it was a huge big deal and I imagine whenever Cena does it it'll be on the same level but uh, don't anticipate that happening anytime soon but when it does it'll be exciting it'll be a lot of fun and it'll completely re rejuvenate his character which right now is pretty boring but uh, won the World Rumble he's a guy that deserves it he's been carrying this company for a long time so hard to argue with Cena being at number 4 although I would say his storyline is not as interesting 
as it could be with Black Lesnar and The Rock being back. So, uh, but it looks like they'll be setting up for The Rock to take on John Cena at WrestleMania. For my money, I still think that's a good match. It's for the WWE title. Uh, it'll make it interesting. Uh, a heavyweight punch. It reminds me a lot of when The Rock faced the, uh, Hulk Hogan back in the day for the title. Uh, and that wasn't the first time those guys had faced off. But it was the first time they faced off for the title. So it's a big deal. Um, so anyway, uh, number four, John Cena. Number three, CM Punk. Uh, not sure, really sure where CM Punk goes from here. He lost the belt, obviously, after carrying it for 434 days as the champ. That's a, that's a pretty monumental uh, title reign, uh, especially nowadays. Guys carry the belt for maybe a month, uh, sometimes later, and defend it even more. And it's not like back in the day where Hulk Hogan would defend that title six times a year. No, this guy seemed to be contending the title almost every Monday. So every Monday night. Um, so that's a big deal, obviously. And again, you know, uh, they wanted him to have that title, but it goes to show what uh, kind of pull he has around the WWE, uh, being able to carry that. I'm sure that was a different man's choice to have him play in that line. I got to assume that was part of his contract deal to uh, uh, be on top for that long for CM Punk. And so uh, got to give, give him credit. Uh, smart behind the scenes work by CM Punk and uh, positioning himself to be in the WWE uh, title picture for a long time. And, more importantly, uh, be in the be in the spotlight. So that's where these guys want to be. That's where they make the money. So it's really these guys for these guys to be pushed back to the back and uh, not used for several months. And uh, CM Punk has made it very clear that is not going to happen to him. So uh, number three, CM Punk. Moving on, number two, Alberto Del Rio. Really getting a heavy push right now. His uh, feud with the Big Show. Uh, you know, it, it's good. It, it's helping. It, they're, they're pushing it. That's for sure. Uh, not a lot of interest for me, but uh, got to love Alberto Del Rio. He's a he's a good young guy. He's got a, he's kind of reminds me of a, of a Mexican version of Million Dollar Man Ted DiBiase. Uh, just a rich guy, but he's kind of turned uh, baby face right now, which means he's kind of a good guy. I think the best it's it's helping his popularity right now, giving helping to give him a good push. But ultimately, this guy is a fantastic villain. He needs to be in that role. Uh, that is what he's good at. There are very few and far between anymore guys that you can really dislike. And then Alberto Del Rio with his his, his, his expensive cars and his, his own announcer and his, and and, and uh, just his personality. He's uh, he's a guy you can really easily hate, and that's what this uh, company needs. So um, I'm anxious for him to turn heel again. That will happen soon, and when it does, it'll be fantastic. But for right now, he's getting a huge push. I don't know if I'd put him at number two. Because uh, he certainly doesn't hold my interest uh, at that level, especially when you, again, you guys, you got guys like The Rock and Brock Lesnar and CM Punk and, and, and The Shield, and there's a lot of other people out there that I like to see more. Not Alberto Del Rio right now, but he's getting a big push, so I guess that's the reason why he comes in at number two in these ESPN power rankings. Put on by a guy named John Robinson. You can catch that on ESPN's front page, or you can, it's a little bit of a small icon, but it is there on the front page if you really want to, if you're having trouble finding it, just Google search ESPN WWE Power Rankings. I'm sure most of you will because you probably don't believe me that ESPN is actually has these rankings up and updated each week, but they do and it is because there are believe it or not people out there like me that do care number one on espn's wwe power rankings if you smell what the rock is cooking the rock yes the rock has returned and uh, this should not surprise anybody if the rock is around and he is in the wwe he is not only the biggest thing going on, but he is the world heavyweight champ. Kind of surprised it took this long to get him the title. I think the only reason why they waited was because he's not going to commit full time and they need guys on Monday Night Raw every single week carrying that title. And that's just not going to happen with The Rock because he's got too many other things going on. But it's an awesome move by WWE having a guy like The Rock around. Uh, kind of throw back to the day of Hulk Hogan when they had, you know, Hulk Hogan kind of transcended the, uh, the WWE and, and went into movies and was just a big star all around. And that's what's going on with The Rock right now. A lot of people don't really put him on the same level as, as Hulk Hogan when they think about wrestling, but uh, that's what he is. That's what's going on right now. It's Hulk Hogan 2.0, except it's The Rock, Rock Johnson, uh, Dwayne Johnson. Um, you yeah, know, it's... Uh, 
it's a it, it's it's fun time to be a wrestling fan. And like I said, this is a lot like it used to be when uh, Hulk Hogan was around and when he had kind of hand, when Andre the Giant handed the torch to Hulk Hogan and then Hulk Hogan handed the torch to The Rock and now The Rock is kind of handing the torch to John Cena uh, who's carrying the torch right now and or has been for a while kind of carrying this company but uh, obviously The Rock is not a guy that's going to stick around too long the light whenever he's there he is the biggest thing going on it was really interesting following Twitter the other night because you know people are tweeting you know why is everybody talking about wrestling so much why is everybody talking about this Royal Rumble so much and uh, it's because The Rock's there, plain and simple. Uh, if The Rock's not there, nobody cares. But if The Rock's there, everybody seems to care. And uh, so as long as he's there, he's going to be relevant, and he's going to be at the top of the charts. Coming up next, we will do our uh, music breakdown. Not sure what we're going to do yet, but we will have some, a music segment coming up next here on The Stumbling Scotsman with Josh Scott. Welcome back to the Stumbling Scotsman. I am your host, Josh Scotton. And here on this segment, I want to talk about one of my favorite bands, one of my favorite musicians in the world, Maynard James Keenan. Yes, he is the lead vocalist for bands like Tool and The Perfect Circle. But who I want to talk about is a band called Pussifer. Um, Maynard James Keenan is a guy that is very well known. Uh, a lot of people uh, would associate him with acts like Tool, which is where he made his uh, big name. But unfortunately, he kind of get all his projects kind of get lumped together and um, uh, get uh, viewed as the same thing. But they are not. All three of those acts are completely different deals altogether. Just because you like one doesn't mean you need to like the other. But um, I do talk to a lot of people that I would uh, that uh, you would think would like what Pussifer does and, and would understand what they do, but uh, there's a lot of people that still don't understand Pussifer because, quite frankly, they're an odd act. Since they don't release, like their intention is not to release full scale albums. They want to write a few, a handful of songs, two, three, four, five, uh, and release them on EPs and release them as little shorts or singles as songs and then remixes of the same song in several different versions. And that's kind of the way they want to approach it. Uh, they do it as a. Uh, independent project they are self-contained they release they re they write record release and publish all of their own stuff so um, it's a kind of a grassroots thing that's really built up and and become something quite big a as of now so uh, but uh, for me even uh, as a huge manager James Keenan fan pretty much everything he's released I have loved uh, until he came out, uh, until Pussifer started uh, coming around, I uh, they released V is for, for Vagina in 2007. That is their first and one of only two full scale albums for them um, since 2007. And uh, that is an album I did not understand at first. Uh, didn't like a lot. Um, didn't uh, really uh, give much of a chance, to be honest with you. I was kind of anticipating something more polished, like you would see in Tool or A Perfect Circle, these kind of ballads of sorts that they write. Um, Pussifer is not that. They 
are uh, fly by the seat of their pants. Whatever is happening at that second, that's what they are playing. And so you get a wide variety of different stuff that it really takes a little while to A, overcome, and B, start to be able to process and then understand what the music is doing. But um, after, it wasn't until I got into the... 2011 Conditions of My Parole. This was their second album. This is what I got and really enjoyed. Sweet baby Jesus on fire I'm gonna need a damn lawyer and a miracle to pull my ass out of this devil kept poking the ball so I should have got the mold down beat cause I was over it. Top to bottom. Uh, every song on this album I like a lot. There's not a bad one. Uh, obviously, some I like more than others, but uh, a lot of different stuff on here. Again, this is what makes it so difficult to understand this band because you got so many different aspects and so many different pieces, and, and, and this is why they don't really do albums because the none, none of it really fits. And none of it really fits together because you get all sorts of different stuff. But I guarantee you listen to this album, Conditions of My Parole, you will at least find one song you like on there. All sorts of good ones. Uh, Green Valley. Hello, stranger. Can you tell us where you've been? More importantly, however, did you come to be here? Though a stranger. Monsoon. Our horizons. Dust devil swept you away. Great album for uh, both great albums, but then once I started getting into that album and kind of got into Pussy First, started dissecting them a little bit, I started getting into some other things and listening to little pieces of songs like a song called Polar Bear. <laughs> is uh, quotations please insert sophomoric genitalia reference yes that is the name of the album and in fact it's not an album I should say it's it's a kind of a mix of live songs there's a lot of good songs on this little this little EP that a lot of them are remixes of songs that were on V is for Vagina and which eventually got me into that album and kind of checking out other things that they've done like Don't Shoot the Messenger where they have some Good uh, uh, remixes. C is for please insert sophomore genitalia reference. Don't you said learn the damn alphabet. I come before you get the pay in your dues. All of these uh, good stuff, and uh, you just kind of got to take, again, it's kind of a journey kind of sorting through it all, but I think if you take the time to kind of sort through it, find all the different pieces. There's also a soundtrack, uh, the, the Heart is the Drum Machine soundtrack with uh, where they do a cover of Rocket Man with uh, uh, some of the people from Flaming Lips, so uh, another interesting listen there. live kind of spaghetti western version of Trekka, uh, which is also a song off he is for vagina and uh that they did in 2009 uh but it's kind of a spaghetti western kind of mix uh, also a good listen as well i don't know but it's been said do or don't and then you're dead so Climb away, get higher, son. Never straight, just 
So, anyways, a lot of good stuff there. Check it out. Uh, if you're some of those people that know have that know of Pussifer and not got into him yet, please don't give up on him. Give him a chance. Go dig a little deeper. Find some other stuff in there. There's a lot of good stuff. You might not like it all, but um, there's so much different stuff. You're bound to like some of it. That's going to do it today for our inaugural episode of The Stumbling Scotsman. I am your host, Josh Scott, and thank you for joining me today in my clubhouse. From the Scott and Stronghold, I am over and out.